Right. So as this title suggests, I'm I'm uh, going to talk uh, to you today a little bit about the Bayesian foundations of phylogenetic and phylogenomic inference. And I know that's a buzzword laden title. Um, and so I'm going to unpack that as we go on. Um, but perhaps I should uh, maybe say that um, it would have been better to call this uh, talk the uh, foundations of Bayesian phylogenetic and phylogenomic inference, because I'm going to talk um, not only about the Bayesian foundations of these concepts, but also just the foundations of these concepts, um, because I think that's important because not everyone um, knows uh, what these things, what these topics are about, and um, I want us all to be on the same page. Okay, so this is uh, the uh, outline of uh, the presentation today. Um, the first four sections, are, the first three sections are all going to be the foundational material. Um, hopefully we should uh, get through those uh, within the first hour up until the coffee break. After the coffee break, um, we can uh, uh, get started on uh, talking about applications. And then in the final 45 minutes, hopefully, of uh, this time, my intent is to walk you through a BEAST 2 tutorial uh, that makes use of some of the concepts that uh, you'll have, that I'll, I'll have spoken about, and hopefully you'll have learned about um, by the end of the course. Okay. So, uh, and, and I just want to reiterate uh, that you're absolutely free to interrupt at any point with, with questions. Um, it makes everything more interesting for everyone, I think. Um, and I, I don't want you to be sitting there not understanding what's going on. Okay. So to get started, I'm going to go right back to the beginning and talk about phylogenies, phylogenetic trees, and their relationship to sequence evolution. Uh, and when I say right back to the beginning, I mean right back to the beginning. Like so, so let's 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 look up phylogenetic trees on Wikipedia, and we see that um, we get this definition that a phylogenetic tree is a branching diagram showing the inferred evolutionary relationships among various biological species or other entities. Um, and uh, when we're inferring this uh, phylogeny, because we usually don't, uh, we're not in a position. Um, to observe it directly, um, we're inferring it based on similarities and differences in the physical or genetic characteristics of the organisms that make up this phylogeny. Okay, now trees in biology uh, and related structures go back a long way. So, so even before Darwin, um, there were uh, theological concepts about uh, the, the idea that you have this, this hierarchy of, of organisms and you have somehow some heavenly being at the top and then you have uh, different, different uh, uh, organisms right down to uh, very, very basic things and minerals at the bottom. Um, so people have been thinking about similar sort of structures for, for a long, long time. Um, much more recently and entering into the time of Darwin, but just before uh, he published his work, uh, people were publishing things that start to look very much like phylogenetic trees. So this is a figure taken from Edward Hitchcock's Elementary Geology, and he was actually a, uh, a skeptic of Darwin's work. Um, but as a geologist, he uh, drew these wonderful um, pictures showing uh, the occurrence of, of different organisms through time, through, through different geological periods. Um, but of course, it wasn't until Darwin that we actually uh, get to today's sort of interpretation of phylogenetic trees as representing the evolution of uh, different species or organisms from a common ancestor. Uh, so very early on in in his note uh, in in his notebooks, um, this uh, this figure appeared, and and this has been copied in in uh, many different places. But this is just uh, some rough notes of Darwin uh, sketching out um, potential evolutionary relationships between uh, different species. Um, you notice that time is not really. Uh, present in a diagram like this is just saying that we have these different uh, different species a b c d and they uh, somehow 
uh, related to one another and and uh, and um, result from um, uh, some some speciation process. Um, the sole figure in the published work of the origin of species um, is actually a phylogenetic tree, and this time. We, we actually see on the vertical axis here, time playing a role. Um, so there is a sense in which as we go up the page, uh, we're moving forward in time. And what we're seeing here are all of these uh, ancestral speciation events um, producing uh, new species uh, going forward in time. And only some of those species actually make it all the way to the present. Okay. So these phylogenetic trees, this is a more modern but still schematic representation of a phylogenetic tree um, relating uh, different primates. Um, and trees are inferred from characteristics of the entities that they relate. So the important thing is that we have some property of, of an organism or a species that is uh, changing through time um, that's, that's uh, inherited. Um, and uh, using our observations of this this uh, this quantity, um, perhaps in the case of species trees, this is often uh, all at the present. Our data usually comes from the present, although we can have fossils as well. Um, that can be used as the basis for inferring phylogenetic relationships. Um, these characteristics are often genetic. Uh, these days, but they may also be phenotypic. And this is very important when you're including fossils in, in this sort of inference, because we don't usually have DNA um, sequences that are uh, associated with fossils. Okay. Now, it's important to note that there's not just one kind of phylogenetic tree. Phylogenetic trees occur on multiple levels. So Originally, uh, these uh, concepts of phylogenetic trees were, were um, uh, representing relationships amongst different species, uh, but we can also draw ancestral relationships between uh, different uh, be between genes that are um, possessed by individuals, uh, individual members of those species, uh, and and it's the genes that actually often constitute our, our data. So if we have uh, sequenced um, some particular marker gene uh, in members of different species, uh, we can use the methods that we describe in this talk um, to reconstruct and infer the uh, phylogeny corresponding to those particular genes. But then if you're interested in the, the species phylogeny, um, while that's related to the gene trees, um, it's not exactly the same. So in this figure, uh, you, you see a, a, a diagram of this. So um, what this is meant to represent is we have uh, these five different species at the present. And from each of these species, we have several different samples of a particular marker gene. Um, and using that, um, uh, the, those uh, genetic sequences, one can build um, the phylogenetic relationships between those, and that's what's represented in these inner trees here. So you, these, these lines represent uh, the individual uh, lineages of each of these genes, and you see that at some point there's some common ancestor found between uh, a pair of these lineages, um, and so on and so forth. And uh, what you can see is that there's there's some that this larger structure, the species tree, that actually represents um, the uh, speciation events in the the ancestry of these species. Um, while the structure of this tree does impose some constraints on the structure of the gene trees, they're not the same thing. So you can't say that the gene tree always gives you the species tree. So they're nested within species trees. Um, and this sort of relationship is important, I think, to point out early on, because it doesn't just exist in the context of species trees and gene trees, but also in the context of transmission trees and pathogen trees. So you can uh, draw a completely analogous 
diagram, where instead of a species here, you have different hosts uh, that are infected by some pathogen in an epidemic. Um, and the inner tree, uh, these, these lines here would represent the phylogeny that you would reconstruct based on the genomic sequences of those pathogens. Um, whereas this larger structure, the, the outer tree, um, would represent the uh, transmission uh, tree, where, where branching events represent uh, transmission events between hosts. Okay, another th thing that's important to point out early on is that uh, in phylogenetics, a very common assumption um, is that the shape of the tree affects the distribution of characters, the, the, the sequence data that you observe, but not the other way around in a causal sense. Um, now, of course, this is not true in general, um, but we try very hard to ensure that this is roughly true for the sequences that we use for phylogenetic inference. And that's the important thing. So the idea here is that on the left-hand side, we have some tree you imagine that this tree is already there. And uh, then the relationship between this tree and the sequence data is that the, the sequence data here is a result of taking some unknown ancestral sequence um, at the, the root of this tree and evolving it according to some uh, process uh, that we'll talk about um, down the edges of the tree eventually to get uh, the sequence data at the end. The important thing is that the, um, the rate, uh, for example, of, of, of branching in the tree um, is not related to the sequence that is um, on the particular lineage. Now, as I said, that's not true in general. Of course, um, we have something called selection. Um, that means that um, the genetic sequences that on a genomic level are extremely important for the, the fitness um, and therefore the branching rate at, at various points in the tree. But if you're looking at just some portion of the sequence, then it can be the case that this portion is evolving neutrally and therefore is not directly affecting the shape of the tree. Okay. So we're focusing here then on neutral evolution. Now, if we have our sequences, um, it stands to reason that we can, at, at, at very least, we can perform some symbol clustering um, and get back uh, something like this hier hierarchical relationship here, um, where um, edge lengths here might represent genetic distance or time. Um, but we want to do better than this. We, we need uh, a model-based approach. Um, the, the Bayesian approaches that we're focusing on today are entirely uh, we're, we're very much related to generative um, processes. So we actually try to model the processes involved that, that generate our data. Um, so we want to employ that approach when we're inferring our phylogenetic trees. <clears throat> and the basic way that we do this is uh, we consider a tree like this, and we imagine that we have some ancestral sequence. Um, and then we go about defining a process by which this uh, sequence is iteratively modified um, as uh, it evolves down the tree. And this is giving rise to the genetic diversity that we see at the present. So I've introduced this mysterious uh, variable here, or symbol Q. And the question is, what is it? Uh, and the answer to that, it gets to the heart of um, the models for sequence evolution. So in the traditional models that are used to reconstruct or infer phylogenetic trees, um, we model nucleotide substitution as a continuous time Markov chain. So basically we consider each site on, uh, in a sequence independently. And we assume that, that the character at that site is changing according to this continuous time Markov chain uh, through time. And the way that works is that, say, we consider this um, P sub T super I of X 
to represent the probability that a nucleotide at uh, site I at time T is in some state X, where X could be GTCA uh, in the case of uh, uh, DNA evolution. Um, so the time development of this probability distribution uh, is going to be determined by this Q, and this Q is now going to be revealed as the transition rate matrix. So basically what that looks like is that uh, each of these, um, so if we consider the result of a, a small increment, so we've got some starting uh, probability um, for uh, GTCNA, that's the one on the right-hand side here, um, the way we get from this probability to the probability at some uh, infinitesimally advanced time um, is by multiplying by this, this matrix. And this matrix uh, involves, I mean, this, if you evaluate this matrix as a whole, this would give you the transition probability matrix uh, for updating the uh, state at this particular site um, um, through this uh, delta t, through this dt uh, time increment. Um, but uh, in general, it, we can expand it out uh, to involve this, um, this transition rate matrix. And each element of this rate matrix Besides the diagonals, they're a little bit special, but um, the each, each uh, non-diagonal element uh, represents the rate, the probability per unit time um, that a particular site will transition from one character to another. Okay. Uh, and basically all of the substitution models that we use in phylogenetic inference um, behave this way. And the only difference between different substitution models generally is this transition matrix, how you define the elements of this transition matrix. Um, I should say that we usually uh, factor out the average rate of substitution. So we, uh, we, we can then talk about the average rate of, of mutation or substitution um, that's separate from the relative rates that appear uh, in the uh, transition matrix. Okay, so just to be a little bit more concrete, um, the most the 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 basic model is the Jukes Cantor model, uh, so called because uh, it was introduced by these particular authors. Um, it's the simplest possible substitution model. Uh, Can I ask a question? On yes, for, for sure. Um, yesterday we talked, learned about these markup chains. About how they um, are uh, looking locally first before looking uh, before moving uh, and uh, looking at the whole um, space. So, is that something gen uh, biologically relevant here? Um, I'm not actually sure. I understand what <laughs> looking. If local I can jump in uh, yes. real okay. quick, uh, you have to be careful not to confuse uh, Markov chains, which are a general kind of tool, and Markov chain Monte Carlo, which is a tool with explore uh, the space of your uh, posterior distribution using local jump. So this is just another kind of application for Markov chains. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that clarification. Uh, it, that is an important distinction, um, particularly because we will use uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, here as well. Um, so it's important to get that uh, out in the open uh, early on. Okay, yes, but we're just talking, we're, we're talking about a, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a, a biologically motivated um, um, process here there's actually we're actually talking about the changes occurring on um, uh, to, to the character at a particular site in a sequence uh, through time due to uh, various random effects uh, during replication okay so so this uh, simplest possible substitution model uh, it might might look a little bit weird because uh, we've got all these one thirds everywhere um, but essentially, uh, this is just for normalization. The important thing here is that every uh, one of these off-diagonal elements of this transition rate matrix are the same. 
which means the, the rate from G to C versus G to A versus uh, um, uh, G to T, uh, these are all identical. Um, and this is not particularly realistic. Uh, we know that certain mutations are more um, uh, occur at a higher frequency than others, um, but it's a good starting point. Um, okay, in particular, there's no difference between transitions and transversions here. So a CT mutation, a GA mutation, and a CA, uh, sorry, yeah, a CA or, or any, uh, all of these kinds of mutations all have exactly the same uh, rate. Um, another important thing here is that the equilibrium distribution is uniform, meaning that if I take some site, evolve it under this model for long enough, the probability that it winds up in any one of the four uh, possible nucleotides uh, is, is the same, which is again something that uh, usually is not what you want. However, it's useful for analytical calculations. It's still, it still does model important things. It models the, the possibility of, for instance, back mutations, where we, we uh, transition from, from some ancestral wild type sequence to, uh, to a, 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 a new uh, uh, character at some site, um, and then go back again. So that's already a property that is not in all models of evolution. Um, so, so this is uh, this is useful in its own right. Okay, and just to demonstrate this, um, we can use uh, the Duke's Cantor model to quite easily compute things like this, which is the probability that after some amount of time, here we've we've uh, rescaled time so that it's in expected substitutions. Um, that's why we don't have this mu parameter appearing at all. Um, we, so this is the probability that after a particular amount of time, a, uh, a, a site uh, will wind up being in some uh, state, some have some character that's different to the starting character. So uh, this p diff starts from uh, zero, um, but increases as, as we go forward in time. So this is, uh, this is p diff in red here. And what you see is that this uh, starts off in increasing uh, linearly right at the, right at the beginning, uh, but then quickly asymptotes to uh, this value of 0.75, which is just due to this random, this uniform distribution that I talked about. Um, so this means that we can, uh, based on the number of um, the, the relative uh, difference between um, a pair of sequences, uh, we can get a, uh, an empirical estimate for this uh, probability um, and uh, turn it on its head and compute an estimate of evolutionary distance. Um, but uh, this is definitely not Bayesian inference here. This is just a very, very straightforward uh, method of moments uh, sort of um, estimator. But um, but nonetheless, it gives you some intuition as to what you should be looking for. If you're actually trying to infer these, these distances, um, you don't want to be inferring distances in this uh, region out here. Because if, if you're uh, you, at this point where the number of possible differences between two pairs, of, uh, between a pair of sequences is close to um, um, this, this limit that you're uh, you get to on average, um, then very small changes in this relative difference are going to result in massive changes to the evolutionary time, meaning that your estimate will be extremely noisy. Okay, so beyond the um, uh, beyond the, the Duke's Cantor model, we've got more complicated things. Uh, this HKY substitution model named after the authors here. Um, is a classic one uh, because it basically ticks all of the, the, main, the main boxes. So it allows for non-equilibrium base frequencies. That, these are actually encoded in this transition matrix uh, by these uh, pies. Um, and also it allows for differences uh, in rate between transitions and transversion. Uh, and these two things mean that together, uh, this is basically the simplest sensible model for neutral DNA evolution. Um, and it's 
I, I think the simplest model that's, that's often used in practice. But we can, of course, go further. Um, there's this more general model that's the most general model um, that also satisfies this property of time reversibility that people often want to build into these uh, models of, of sequence evolution for technical reasons. Um, it has uh, 10 parameters. So it's, it's already starting to have quite a, a large number of parameters. Um, and all of the other time reversible models, including HKY and Juice Cantor, are special cases of this. Okay, so that's that, That's just some, some background to get you used to some of these concepts and, and some of these um, models that you hear quite a lot uh, when you're looking through um, phylogenetic literature and uh, using phylogenetic software. Um, the phylogenetic likelihood is now something that we can define. So uh, we have a process that takes us from this ancestral sequence that's unknown. Um, that uh, takes us from the sequence to our observed sequences at the tips of the, uh, the, the leaves of this tree. Um, the sequences at the leaves, uh, we're going to assume that we know them um, and that they're all nicely aligned. Uh, notice that there's no, uh, in this model, there's, there's nothing about insertions or deletions. Um, uh, and, and so everything is just um, homologous point mutations, um, meaning that in order to, to do this inference, you need a, an aligned sequence. Um, so this is our, our sequence alignment here, uh, our observation. Um, if we call our tree uh, uh, T, then what we can write down, at least in principle, is the probability of our sequence alignment given the tree um, given this substitution rate matrix, and usually given also uh, things like um, the uh, the equilibrium uh, starting frequencies for for the characters at the beginning. Um, so for the models that I've described so far, this can be evaluated in linear time using dynamic programming. It's still quite expensive, and linear time I mean linear in the number of leaves on the tree, um, which is a, a very useful thing to be able to do. Um, and uh, this is the basis for Bayesian phylogenetic inference. So um, in principle, all you need is this. This is your likelihood. You throw in some prior over tree space um, and turn the, the wheels of the Bayesian machinery, and uh, you get out your posterior over trees. Of course, uh, nothing's uh, ever quite as simple as that. Um, and uh, we'll talk about the way it's done in practice uh, later on. But before I get to that, I'm going to now jump over to uh, talking about the second part, which is phylodynamics. But before I do, does anyone have any quick questions about this first part? Keep in mind that I, I, I'm aware that I've skipped over a lot. I can't talk about everything, but... Um, is there any major lack of understanding? Okay, that's good. <clears throat> so section two, we're going to talk about phylogenetics. So uh, what is phylogenetics? This is probably the most buzzwordy term from that, that title. Um, it's a fairly recent term that was introduced by Grenfell in, and others in, in 2004 in a particular science paper. Um, and it to quote uh, the paper, refers to the interplay between immunodynamics, epidemiology, and evolutionary biology, and the effect this has on the shape of pathogen phylogenies, which uh, sounds all very highfalutin. Um, but essentially, it boils down to the fact that uh, the uh, population, the context within the, which the phylogenetic tree evolved, um, affects its shape. So the shape of a phylogenetic tree, and by the shape, I mean mostly here the timing of the events that appear on the tree, uh, can be uh, influenced by the, the, um, the population uh, dynamics through time. So here we've got some population that's exponentially increasing through time, and that gives rise to some so characteristic tree shape. We've got 
populations that are constant through time. They have other qualitatively different tree shapes on, on average. Um, then beyond just population dynamics, it's also possible that there is some structure in the population, meaning there are some uh, subpopulations between which there is uh, uh, potentially limited gene flow or, or some uh, difference in, um, in, in growth rate or decay rate within these subpopulations. And this gives rise to different uh, um, uh, differently shaped uh, tree topologies. Um, and uh, then there is also, although we have, I've, I've said that we're ignoring it, um, we uh, are also, of course, uh, going to see differences in, in the shape of these trees um, due to the presence or absence of selection. So all of these things affect the shape of the tree. Um, and we can see this if we look at trees reconstructed from uh, uh, pathogen sequences. Uh, for different uh, diseases. Uh, you can see qualitative differences between, for instance, um, influenza A virus uh, phylogenies that tend to have this ladder shape, uh, these dengue phylogenies where you have the different dengue strains um, having uh, um, um, appearing as, as very distinct clades uh, in this overall tree. HIV has a particular shape. Um, within hosts, uh, HIV has, has its own particular shape that starts to look a little bit like um, influenza on the population level and so on. So this is just to say that uh, there is this very strong influence on the, uh, of, of the context on which the evolution, in which the evolution is happening on the shape of the tree. Um, and whenever there's an effect like this, we can, it starts to make us think that we can do inference somehow. Um, now, these days, we tend to use a broader definition of, of this term um, and just say that phylogenomics is the study of uh, the relationship between phylogenetic trees and the populations that produce them. So with phylogen phylogenetics, the question is, um, what does the uh, genetic sequence data tell us about the tree? For phylogenomics, the question is, what does the tree tell us about the population that produced it? Now, of course, population can mean a lot of different things. Um, the main context of uh, phylogenomics originally was epidemiology, but of course we could be talking not just about um, pathogen populations or host populations, we might be talking about um, populations of, um, of animals uh, in some ecological uh, context, or we could be talking at a very large scale about populations of species. And here the word population starts to be a, a very strange uh, kind of idea to apply to species, but we can, we can still do that. Okay. Um, so, Again, just as we, we needed some generative process to connect uh, these uh, substitution models to the, um, um, sorry, to, to connect the genetic sequence data to a phylogenetic tree, we need a uh, tree generation process to connect the phylogenetic tree to its encompassing um, population. And there, there are two main families of tree generating processes. The first, uh, first ones that I'll talk about are these um, so-called birth death sampling models. These assume that the tree is the result of a population evolving under a forward time birth death model uh, with an explicit sampling process. So this is, this is a particular Markov model where uh, the, um, the, the two events, uh, you basically have two events that can happen at any point in time. Uh, and these are the increase by one in the population size or a decrease by one in the population size. Um, then there are uh, coalescent models, which assume in a very general sense that the tree is the result of a backward in time process, although it's still connected to forward in time uh, uh, processes. But mathematically, uh, it's the result of a backward in time process that success successively merges pairs of lineages together. Um, at uh, rates that are related to an effective population size. 
So this best death sampling model that I mentioned, um, this is this is a, a particularly uh, simple example of a birth death sampling model, or rather, this is a diagram depicting a very simple example of a birth death sampling model, um, where this box I represents uh, a, a compartment of individuals of a particular type, and all of these these individuals in this uh, compartment are completely indistinguishable, and they are reproducing. Uh, at rate lambda. So each individual here has a fixed probability per unit time of producing new individuals at rate lambda. Um, and then there's a decay rate so of, of mu. So this is the, again, a, a probability per unit time that every individual in this compartment has of being removed from the compartment. And then this, this uh, peculiar little dot here with the S is representing a probability S uh, with which every individual uh, removed from the from the compartment um, results in a sample, um, uh, i.e. a leaf on the on our phylogenetic tree. So this is a sampling probability. Um, so the main parameters for this process, although there are, there are many different versions of this process um, and uh, some are parameterized uh, differently. But in this, in this case, our parameters are the birth rate lambda, the total death rate mu, and then this sampling probability. Um, if, if the sampling probability were one, that would mean that every death in the population uh, or every removal resulted in a, a leaf on our phylogenetic tree. Um, whereas if this was zero, we would never see a phylogenetic tree. Um, in, uh, uh, usually in, in, in the um, cases we care about, um, this uh, sampling probability is, is less than one, but greater than zero. And then the, the other parameter of importance is the length of the process, um, the so-called time of origin. Now, with this kind of model, we can, uh, I, although I'm not gonna describe how we compute this, uh, but we can write down the probability of a phylogenetic tree um, given all of these parameters. So then this paves the way to uh, using phylogenetic trees um, to infer these parameters. So this becomes the likelihood for these parameters given the tree. Now, coalescent models, as I said, uh, are somewhat different. Um, I'm going to describe them very roughly uh, in, uh, in the context that they're uh, often related to, which is uh, this Wright-Fisher model. Now, Wright-Fisher model is a model of population genetics um, that traditionally involves a fixed population size. Um, and this, this row of circles here, um, forget about their colors for the, for the moment, is representing all of the individuals that are alive in one generation. Um, and then what we're going to do is imagine that we can look back in time and see the, the previous generation. Now, if we have these three sampled individuals of uh, generation I, uh, the, the present day generation, we can ask what is the probability that any of these sampled uh, uh, individuals share a parent in the previous generation. Now, this is a, a very easy um, uh, question to answer in the context of this Wright-Fisher model, which assumes that um, parents uh, are drawn uniformly at random um, from, uh, from the whole generation. So if I ask what is the parent of this particular individual here, um, this is chosen uniformly at random from the previous generation. So it could be any one of these individuals, um, meaning that the probability that this second individual has exactly this, um, the same parent as the, the first individual uh, is just going to be one on N. Um, so this question for, for two individuals is just uh, one on N, the probability that two individuals share a parent in the previous generation is one on N. For three individuals, uh, one can answer this ex exactly, but what we do 
in the context of these coalescent models is to make an approximation because eventually we're going to assume that population size is very large. So what we assume is that um, our population is very large and so we can treat each pair of individuals independently and approximate the probability of any uh, um, parent sharing in the previous generation between any pair of these um, individuals that are sampled in the present um, is simply three times this pairwise uh, coalescent uh, probability. So this is correct, assuming that uh, n is much greater than three. Now, this, uh, this right Fisher model, uh, eventually, if you follow this back, if you trace back the ancestry, uh, um, according to this rule that each, each parent is chosen uniformly at random from the previous generation, we get this red tree. Um, and we can also observe that in general, um, again, employing, employing this approximation, the probability that a coalescence, i.e. a sharing of a parent, uh, will occur in any particular generation uh, is k choose 2 multiplied by 1 and n. And k is the number of uh, sampled lineages we're considering at that point in time. So we start out with 3 here. Um, once we've we've found this common ancestor between these individuals here, this k becomes two because there are only two uh, lineages that we care about. Um, so by successfully by by going back in the different in the generations and asking what is the probability of coalescence, we can compute uh, the probability of seeing a tree like this red tree, um, given a particular population size. Now, again, I'm going to gloss over details, but what we're doing here is taking the limit as the population size becomes extremely large. Um, there's a, another little detail that because we're shifting to continuous time here, we need to consider the time between successive generations. So if we define this to be little g here, um, then the particular limit that we take is we take n to infinity, um, and g to zero, such that the product and g remains uh, the same. And if we do that, um, these uh, these call these fixed coalescent probabilities that we we talked about on the previous slide become fixed coalescent rates, um, and these give rise to exponentially distributed waiting times between coalescent events. Meaning that under this model, if you ask what is the um, probability distribution that governs the time between the present and this first merging event here? Uh, the answer is going to be an exponential distribution with a rate k choose 2 multiplied by 1 on ng, where k here is 4. Um, so that's an exponential distribution for this first interval. You have another exponential distribution for this uh, second interval and another for this third interval, each time just changing the k. Uh, to be the appropriate number of lineages. So by doing that, we can evaluate the probability of a phylogenetic tree um, under uh, this, this coalescent uh, um, model. Okay, so in general, um, with birth death, uh, with, with a birth death model, uh, we have some population size that's determined by a birth death process. Um, this birth death sampling process that we described also um, produces uh, events corresponding to sampled uh, individuals. So these are the times at which uh, we, we see our, our sequence data. Um, and uh, there's a relationship between um, this uh, birth death trajectory uh, this realization of the um, of the process and the sample times and our phylogenetic tree. Um, in the context of the um, uh, coalescent model, instead our our parameters are instead of birth rates and death rates. Um, in the general sense, the parameter becomes the coalescent rate through time. Uh, and uh, another way to think about this is the effective population size through time. Um, which can be given a parametric form, if you like, but, but could also be quite, um, quite free 
In general, though, we're just going to write that um, the tree T is uh, related to our um, uh, follow dynamic parameters, be they birth rates or death rates or coalescent rate functions um, via this particular conditional probability that we're going to variously call the follow dynamic likelihood or the uh, tree prior, depending on um, how you like to, to think about things. Okay. And then uh, all that's left to do at this point is to uh, join these concepts together um, and actually talk about Bayesian uh, follow genetic and follow dynamic inference. So given that we have a phylogenetic likelihood and we can compute it, um, and we have our phylogenetic likelihood or our tree prior, and we can compute that, um, we can combine these two functions uh, with some priors on the parameters, uh, which in this case are the substitution rate matrix and the parameters of the phylogenetic model um, to produce uh, this expression that's essentially Bayes' theorem. Um, and on the left-hand side, we're left with our joint phylogenetic or phylogenetic posterior. So we wind up with a posterior distribution over trees and all of the parameters of, this, of these models that we've been talking about, conditional on our sequence alignment. Um, so yeah, as I said, um, P of A given T and Q is the phylogenetic likelihood. We have our tree prior and we have our parameter priors. <clears throat> so one, there, there are some subtleties. There, there are lots of subtleties that I'm glossing over, I'm sorry. Um, but just here, I'm glossing over some subtleties uh, because uh, one can ask whether this tree prior is, is really a prior in the usual sense. Does it depend on the data? Um, the way I've written it here, uh, it, it seems to not depend on the data, but then uh, consider the sorts of trees that we've been uh, thinking about. If we go back here and think, think about this tree here, this red tree, um, the red tree uh, is, is a collection of uh, edge lengths um, uh, and a collection of node times. And among the node times are also the, the times of these leaves at the end, so the, the times of our samples. Um, and these are usually assumed to be fixed in the analysis. We, 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 I mean, it is possible to estimate these as well in certain situations, um, but generally they're assumed to be fixed, uh, which means that when we compute this object here, we're usually, the, this tree does include some information that is fixed by our data. Um, meaning that uh, this, uh, even though it's sometimes called a tree prior, uh, does include uh, some data on the left-hand side of the conditional. Another thing that's uh, maybe interesting to think about is what this PA actually represents. This is um, our, our normalization constant, our marginal likelihood um, for our, um, our, uh, our, our base theorem here. Um, but uh, from a practical sense, um, in order to evaluate this, you would need to uh, expand this out um, into something like this uh, top line here, um, the numerator, and integrate over every combination of tree and, uh, um, and different parameter values which of course is extremely difficult and uh, infeasible in general. Um, that, that aside, some practical characteristics of the Bayesian approach include uh, the fact that we're jointly inferring the phylogenetic tree, these substitution model parameters, these evolutionary rates, um, and the birth and death rates or population sizes all together. Um, despite the fact that in many cases, uh, you may be interested in only some of these things. So in the context of pathogen phylogenies, you're often only interested in inferring the rates. 
the particular phylogenetic structure that you see isn't necessarily necessarily of uh, importance. Um, in contrast, if you're looking at species trees, maybe you are genuinely interested in the the um, the, the tree itself. Um, and in which case, the, this tree prior really would just be a tree prior, and you're you're not really interested in the parameters of it. Okay, but because we're doing a, this joint Bayesian approach, the it correctly accounts for uncertainty um, at all levels, both in the phylogenetic tree itself um, and the model parameters. The nice side effect of doing everything this way, I'm, I'm sure you've already seen in the course, but, but this allows you to include other sources of information um, uh, by way of the priors on the parameters. So we could include some additional information that tells us what the population size is through time and uses this as the bait as the starting point for our analysis. And that would naturally include both this information and the information from the genetic data. Okay, and then so once you have the posterior, then this uh, includes the uncertainty, um, uh, all of these uncertainties in the inference results. Um, another thing that's, I mean, we've talked about it briefly already, but but something that's very clear if we go back to this um, this factorization here, this is only possible because of this neutrality assumption, and and the reason. Um, um, that that is, is is quite clear when you consider that doing this factorization means that it's entirely possible that our data could have been, of course they weren't, but they could have been, assuming these models are correct, they could have been produced in this fashion. We could have drawn some uh, um, parameters from our prior distributions, so drawn some substitution rates, drawn some birth and death parameters, etc. Simulated a tree using these uh, parameters, and then only after that simulated the sequence alignment. And that would be statistically indistinguishable from doing it all together. And um, because because we've uh, separated out the uh, sequence line, uh, simulation here, it means then that the sequences themselves can have no impact directly on the shape of this tree. This is not to say that the sequences you observe don't have uh, don't don't tell you things about the shape of this tree. Of course they do. Um, just in terms of the causal relationship, there's no sense in which the sequences at these uh, internal edges uh, result in differently uh, structured trees. Okay. So what's so difficult about all this? It all sounds very easy. Of course, the difficulty is integration. So the fact that our Bayes theorem has this denominator, our, our marginal likelihood um, that involves this vast integration over tree space um, makes the whole thing impractical. Um, and we can't do this analytically. Uh, we can't do this in, in any really obvious brute force uh, fashion either because the, the size of tree space is uh, enormous. Um, so what do we do? Uh, and I think you all, given uh, what you've learned in the previous days, know the answer to this question, we've got to take a trip to Monte Carlo. And in particular, we need to go to the casino, uh, which is uh, where the um, Monte Carlo methods get their names. Um, because they are games of chance. And so in our context, these Monte Carlo methods are algorithms which produce random samples of values in order to characterize a probability distribution over those values. Um, and usually these algorithms we deal with um, seek to produce an arbitrary number of independent samples of our parameters. And by parameters here, I mean, not just the model parameters, but also the trees uh, drawn from the, the joint posterior distribution. The way this goes, um, I'm not going to dwell on this because you've obviously seen it before, um, but this algorithm produces, uh, we're going to use a particular Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, Metropolis Hastings, um, which produces samples um, ideally from a distribution, call it f of x, by generating a random walk over possible values of x. So imagine that we've got this distribution f of x, we want to draw samples from it. 
Um, we have some starting value of X that's arbitrarily chosen. And what we're going to do is propose a modified uh, version of X. So we're just going to choose a new value X prime that's somewhere within this, this window. Maybe the new value is up here. And what we do is just evaluate F of X prime and compare that to F of X. If it's uh, bigger, we definitely make this move. If uh, we, and we iterate this process. And if, if the, the new value is uh, smaller, then we uh, only make this move to this new value um, with a particular probability of acceptance that's related to the uh, F evaluated at this uh, new X prime divided by uh, F evaluated at X. Um, and uh, so this, this is nice because the walk explores mostly high probability areas. So you're focusing on the distribution part of the, the um, parameter space that has uh, significant support. Um, because F of X only appears in this algorithm as this ratio, um, the normalization of F is not important. So in other words, um, because we can evaluate our um, posterior distribution up to some multiplicative constant, um, we can compute this acceptance probability without having to normalize it. And that's what allows us to use MCMC um, to tackle these much larger problems. Now, that's MCMC in general. For MCMC in the phylogenetic tree uh, context, um, we need to think a little bit more abstractly about what it will concretely actually what about what it means to um, to uh, traverse this state space because our state space involves all of the possible phylogenetic trees that are out there so um, to do that you need to modify not just your substitution model parameters and your birth death model parameters you also need to modify your tree and modifying the tree usually involves employing a large suite of different tree moves or operators uh, that update various aspects of the tree. So there's uh, a move that, um, imagine this, this tree on the left here, this is a portion of some, some tree and you've got uh, some subtree here and we disconnect it from the rest of the tree and reattach it somewhere else randomly on the tree. Um, that's an example of, of such a move. Uh, and there are lots of others uh, that adjust the tree in various ways. Um, but the important thing is that through, com uh, through combining these moves, you're capable of moving from any one tree to any other tree um, that is a possible explanation for the ancestry of a particular set of se sequences. And provided that's the case, uh, you can use this to construct a valid MCMC algorithm. Um, I think I'm going to have to pause there because I think we have a uh, coffee break for 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah, so that's that's just a rough idea of how MCMC works in tree space. Um, but otherwise, it works exactly the way as it works in other spaces as well. Um, okay, so as you know, the result of an MCMC algorithm, particularly the the, the very simple univariable algorithm, I... I um, I used as illustration is this so-called trace uh, where we see the um, particular variable values uh, explored by this random walk um, as time progresses. But if we uh, plot a, um, a histogram or kernel density estimate of uh, the, the states that are visited, uh, we get something like this. Um, so this, this dash line is the target distribution. Um, this blue line is the uh, kernel density estimate from the uh, MCMC trace. And as we run this thing for longer and longer, eventually these, uh, this blue line should converge to this uh, red dash line. Um, of course, we're never going to run it forever. So uh, we have to deal with uh, imperfection. Um, and in doing so, we have to account for the fact that adjacent samples um, from the MCMC uh, uh, um, process uh, 
are of course correlated. And you can see that. I mean, if you just look at this, uh, this trace through time, you can see that um, when uh, for, for states from adjacent, uh, uh, for adjacent steps, we can see that the, um, the actual states don't change much at all um, in a relative sense. Um, and this means that you need to run the algorithm for a certain amount of time before you, uh, before you can start counting these uh, states as in any sense uh, independent. And the, the first uh, decorrelation you have to worry about is this first period, uh, the so-called burn-in, because this, this first value of x or the first tree that we pick in a phylogenetic inference is going to be uh, somewhat arbitrarily chosen. Um, and it's not going to be chosen based on the, the posterior distribution that you're trying to characterize. Um, and for this reason, it's important to discard this uh, hard to define, but, but, but this, this first uh, uh, period, this burn-in period, where we're waiting essentially for the MCMC algorithm to forget the starting state. Um, and then we can start thinking about, you know, the, the position, um, the, the particular value um, or position in state space as being related to the posterior. But once we've chosen a sample, we need to wait another amount of time to get another sample and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, this, this, is, this is a picture that we have to keep in mind. Okay. In practice, how the what what things look like uh, when we're doing these uh, phylogenetic analyses um, using the the tools that you'll you'll see later on in the demonstration and the tutorial um, is, is like this. So we get a, a histogram for a particular prominent notice on the left hand side. Here is this table. In this table are essentially all of the different parameters and some some uh, useful summary statistics. Um, corresponding to a particular inference setup. So there's a lot of them. Um, but as I said, often you're only interested in a handful of parameters. And so it's possible to just single out those parameters, plot the histogram of states visited by the MCMC for just that parameter and treat that as the marginal posterior for a particular parameter. So in this case, this is the marginal posterior of the tree height or the, the age of the root of the tree um, in a uh, analysis of Zika um, genetic sam samples, Zika virus samples. For the tree itself, um, that's obviously a little bit more complicated to visualize because that is not just a one-dimensional object. Um, but you can do worse than using tools like this. Uh, this is a, a density tree, so-called density tree output. Um, uh, a particular piece of software designed by Remco Buka. And uh, what we're seeing here are trees sampled as part of this MCMC uh, process just laid on top of each other. Um, so you get a rough idea of the amount of uncertainty uh, involved in the phylogenetic reconstruction. So this blue that's overlaid is just one, essentially a point estimate of the tree. It's a summary of the posterior distribution, but you can see in green all these overlaid lines, particularly back in the toward the root of the tree, there's a lot of uncertainty to do with the uh, particular ordering of these, these merging events between the different lineages and the timing of these, uh, these merging events. Um, whereas toward the leaves, you can things, see things are a lot more certain. Okay. Are there any questions about uh, the uh, uh, about Bayesian inference applied to phylogenetics and phylogenomics before I get into the applications? Particularly, any conceptual questions? If not, then I will proceed. Uh, to talk about applications. So I'm going to talk about two separate applications today, um, both involving uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, which is not too much of a surprise. That's been on a lot of uh, 
on, on the minds of a lot of people um, doing this sort of work for the last few years. Um, and in particular, so, so the, the first of these, um, I'm going to discuss uh, a, a project that I was involved with trying to infer the basic reproductive number uh, associated with individual outbreaks of SARS-CoV-2 right at the start of the epidemic. So this basic reproductive number, for those of you who have not encountered this before, uh, represents the average number of secondary transmissions resulting from a host, an infected host, um, uh, um, that, that finds itself in a completely naive uh, population of other hosts. Um, and so this is something that you can, that is traditionally estimated uh, directly from case count data. Um, so just looking at the number of uh, of positive test cases through time um, and trying to, to use this to um, estimate the, the growth rate of these curves. Uh, but there are several reasons why this is uh, sometimes suboptimal, um, not least of which uh, this uh, the results that you get there can depend heavily on um, the way uh, testing is done. So hopefully with a genetic-based uh, inference, we can avoid some of these biases. Um, so happily, soon after SARS-CoV-2 emerged, uh, lots of institutions began sharing genomic sequences on the GISAID uh, genomic sharing platform. Um, this was very widespread, unlike any uh, uh, epidemic in the past, I think. Uh, definitely the scale was very, very different. Um, and as I said, these have the potential to yield more robust estimates via phylogenomics. So the, the process involves jointly reconstructing trees and inferring uh, birth and death rates um, of a phylogenomic model and relating these to the basic reproductive number. So for this particular analysis, we're looking at really early uh, sequence data. So the, the data that was available very early on before public health measures were implemented. That's the important thing. Because of course, once uh, once such measures are implemented, um, the, uh, the whole aim of, of those measures is to affect this uh, reproductive number. So we want to get the raw value before they were uh, modified by these measures. And so you can see we've got a, a large distribution of, of sequences. Um, the largest single outbreak we consider is this outbreak in Washington state in the USA, uh, comprising 217 genomes. Um, but you can also see we have very, very small outbreaks as well, uh, such as this one in Australia and this secondary outbreak in uh, Washington state for which we only had nine uh, samples. So of course, there are lots of challenges to do with um, tree inferences early in the epidemic or in epidemics in general. Um, so firstly, we have limited diversity. So remember that the signal we're using to reconstruct phylogenetic trees is based on sequence diversity. Uh, we need there to be a large number of uh, mutations or substitutions appearing in the ancestry of a particular set of sequence data in order to be able to reconstruct the tree. If all of our sequences are identical, then we're not going to be able to reconstruct anything. Um, another uh, problem, it's always a problem. The sample collection is always going to be full of unknown biases. Um, sequencing errors at this point weren't very well characterized. So it wasn't clear always which, uh, which sites to ignore. Um, in sequence alignments. So all this means is uh, that we have to uh, be very careful when interpreting these results. So we analyzed these sequences uh, under the so-called birth death skyline model. So this is exactly the same model that we discussed earlier, uh, this the simple birth death model. The only difference being is that we let the, uh, the birth rates and death rates and sampling rates change in a piecewise constant manner through time. So we allow there to be these uh, time intervals during which all of these rates are constant, uh, 
but then we allow these uh, rates to be different in different time intervals. And it's very easy to modify the model uh, to allow for that. <coughs> Pardon me. So as, as I said, we've got these birth rates and death rates. In this case, we've got a sampling rate um, rather than a sampling probability. As I said earlier, there are different ways of parameterizing it. Um, we can modify this parameterization to be very epi-focused by defining a reproductive number. Here I've written RE, but in the context of this early time, it should be R0. Um, this is related to the birth and death rates just uh, via this ratio. So the reproductive number is just the birth rate divided by the death rate. Okay. Um, we fix some of these parameters. We fix the uh, removal rate. So this is the total death rate. Um, we, we fix it so that the, it's inverse, which is the average uh, amount of time that an individual host remains infectious is 10 days, which is roughly corresponding to what was known about uh, <clears throat> the disease at that point in time. <clears throat> Pardon me. Okay, and uh, this is what we see. Uh, so we saw um, a large number of these outbreaks had very similar uh, basic reproductive numbers, and this is sort of what we expect. And these uh, range between 2.5 uh, and, uh, and uh, 1.5, um, so somewhere around two. There were outliers for sure. Um, definitely Iceland uh, is an outlier. This particular um, small Washington state outbreak, uh, we infer a very high R0. Um, also Wales and uh, the Diamond Princess also. Uh, we inferred quite a high reproductive number. Although for the diamond process in particular, um, I'm inclined to believe this number. Now, in looking for an interpretation as to why some of these uh, reproductive numbers were inferred to be quite high, um, it's interesting to, to note that the, um, the sample ranges, so the, the total length of time uh, for which we have samples, um, were shortest for the uh, um, outbreaks that had a very high um, estimated R0. So this uh, WA state two um, outbreak, uh, both Iceland outbreaks only. So this is in days, uh, just to give you an idea of how how um, how short these time windows were. So this is this is five days here. So the WA state was only. Uh, around about three days of, of sequence data. Um, and so this, this is, and Wales too, it's just over five, six days. Um, so the outbreaks with the largest inferred R0 have shorter sampling windows, which gives us an idea that's uh, um, biases due to uh, our, the, the sampling process may be um, a, a problem here. <laughs> Other things we looked at were the potential that the R0 corresponding to different outbreaks actually were identical. So we placed what's known as a Dirichlet process prior on these outlet, outbreak specific R0 values. Um, and this allowed us to infer the number of unique values. And it seems like this data really wants uh, each outbreak to more or less have its own um, R0 value. Now we can go beyond this as well. Uh, we, we don't have to restrict ourselves to inferring uh, both trees, although we're not really interested in trees here, um, or and uh, the um, R naught parameters. We can also infer uh, the actual uh, case numbers through time. Um, and the way we go about doing that is using what's known as particle filtering um, to impute trajectories. These are um, I'm using the word impute here because these are uh, these trajectories, these are these the, the actual population dynamics for these outbreaks, the number of infected hosts through time. This is something that is sort of already contained in the model as a, as a concept that exists, but to this point, we've integrated it out uh, from our uh, probability calculations. 
So all we need to do is put it back in. Um, and the way we do that is to use this particle filtering. So to do that, what we do is imagine we've got some tree. We'll simplify it just so that we can uh, uh, talk about it without introducing too much complexity. And the way we, we go about doing this is that we um, break this tree up. And I should say that this, this tree would be um, a sampled tree from our MCMC analysis. So partway along our MC anal MCMC analysis, um, we, we in, in one particular step of the MCMC, we have a tree and we have a corresponding set of parameters. Um, so conditional on this tree and these parameters, our goal here is to infer um, or sample the uh, population dynamics through time. So to do that, we break this tree up into these, these partial trees that are called G1, G2, and so on and so forth. Um, and then for each of these, what we do is we simulate a birth-death process. Um, so here is a such a realization of the process. Um, and for a given realization of the process, we can step along it and compute uh, the probability of observing this portion of the tree conditional on the parameters that we've uh, that, that we have, and uh, this um, um, this uh, realization of the birth death process, um, and this just looks like a product of these terms that involve a coalescent probability, um, and so it's it's very easy to compute. Um, these coalescent probabilities are um, uh, looking like this, they're, they're very easy to derive and to compute. Um, and we essentially do this over and over again for lots and lots of different realizations. We compute these weights for each of these realizations and then um, uh, perform uh, sequential uh, importance resampling um, in order to um, condition these realizations on the tree and the parameters. So by doing this, uh, we get uh, posterior distributions over the birth death trajectories through time. And here are some examples from some of these outbreaks. This is uh, the example from the Diamond Princess. The Diamond Princess analysis was a little bit different to the others because this is this uh, cruise ship that you might remember from the news uh, right back at the start of the epidemic um, that uh, was denied entry to a lot of countries because it had... Um, a, a massive outbreak on board. Now, a lot is known about that particular um, outbreak. Uh, namely, we know exactly when the first uh, patient zero arrived on board. We know when um, uh, the outbreak was discovered, and we know that quarantine happened immediately following this. Um, and so in this uh, analysis, we assume that the birth rates and uh, reproductive number is different in this first interval prior to the um, quarantine compared to after the quarantine. Uh, and that's why we see this little, uh, uh, little um, inflection point here. Now, the, the gray lines are all of these uh, sampled uh, case numbers. Um, the uh, pink here is the 95% um, highest posterior density. Um, the orange is the median and these little triangles, uh, sorry, these little diamonds represent um, the recorded case numbers. And you can see that there is a relatively nice correspondence in this case. There are also examples where there is not great correspondence. This, uh, this example from Spain, we get very poor correspondence. Um, and also from France here. Um, but if, if we just look at the uh, final case numbers. So these are all cumulative case numbers. If we just look at the final case numbers and compare them, finally inferred case numbers and compare them to the actual uh, recorded case numbers, um, this is what we see. So actually counterintuitively, um, a lot of the recorded case numbers are higher than, than what we infer. Um, and that's, it's peculiar because we, would expect that we would, in principle, if our model is correct, uh, we should be inferring the, the total case numbers regardless of whether or not they've tested positive or like, actually been picked up by a testing center. Um, so our explanation as to why we infer smaller values is that the sequences we have don't reflect the true genetic diversity in each of these uh, 
outbreaks. So we're actually missing uh, significant portions, portions of um, the, the epidemic. Um, there's one sort of main uh, uh, counter example, the, the diamond princess, we're actually inferring larger numbers, although in this case, uh, I would believe that the diamond here, I think this is due to the fact that our, our model is in this case, um, um, not capable of, of uh, treating this upper bound on the number of cases that um, exists aboard a uh, confined uh, cruise ship. Okay, so just some take home messages from that. The, uh, we can, in principle, at least, uh, infer valuable epidemiological parameters from this genetic data. Um, these inferences are complementary to those from the more traditional line list data, the, the case uh, records. Um, uh, but they do still remain susceptible, at least in the way we've used them, to sampling bias um, through the distribution of sample times. Okay, um, but oh, that that said, it's it's important to note that um, even breaking up the uh, the data set into these different sub outbreaks um, necessitated the use of sequence data. So we would not even have been able to do this analysis properly without uh, the genetic sequence data. So despite the fact that maybe the the results are are not um, uh, fantastic and have high uncertainties attached to them, um, being able to divide up the sequences this way is only possible because we were able to build a larger phylogenetic tree and isolate uh, clusters from it. Okay. Did anyone have any uh, quick questions about that last application? No. Okay, so then moving on, uh, this second application um, is, uh, um, although it, uh, it's still using data from the same year, um, uh, 2020 was a very long year. And so toward the end of it, um, we had far more sequence data. So together, Swiss Institute sequenced over 11,000 SARS-CoV-2 genomes just in 2020. And despite Switzerland being a relatively small country, um, this was still the sixth largest pro uh, program globally. So that's something to be proud of. Um, so, and over the, the course of the same time period, um, contact tracing was being applied uh, uh, um, in order to attempt to terminate individual transmission chains. So this was a very important main method that uh, we were using early on to try to stamp out um, uh, transmission chains where sometime after testing positive, uh, you would provide information on all of your contacts for the last few days and a dedicated team of people would uh, track these people down and perform tests on them and um, and isolate anyone who is uh, who is obviously uh, testing positive. Um, so what we aim to do with this uh, huge amount of sequence data was to try to determine the degree to which contact tracing um, in Switzerland was effective at reducing the propensity for ongoing transmission. Um, now, in order to do this, uh, we first had to, because we had uh, so much sequence data, um, we uh, were able to try to counteract some of these, um, um, these sampling biases. And uh, so to do this, we subsampled sequences up to 5% of the confirmed cases per week in each canton all throughout 2020. Um, and based on these subsampled sequences, we built a maximum likelihood tree so not a Bayesian tree, but just a maximum likelihood tree because there's still a very large number of uh, sequences. Uh, using these sequences together with uh, genetically se uh, similar sequences from abroad, the goal for this was to break up this uh, tree uh, into uh, subtrees uh, 
containing that we're actually representing uh, local transmission clusters. Because if you, uh, even though uh, you might have sequences just from Switzerland, if we build a phylogenetic tree, we're inevitably going to um, have a, a lot of detail on that tree that's representing the evolution of uh, the, the pathogen outside of Switzerland. And if we're really interested in uh, inferring properties of the epidemic inside of Switzerland, it's important for us to uh, draw a box around those portions of this very large tree that correspond to uh, evolution within the country. And this is what we, we did here. Um, now we had two subtly different approaches to this partitioning that yielded either large clusters or small clusters. And for all of the analyses, we uh, applied these to both sets of clusters um, in order to, to check uh, whether our results were robust uh, to this uh, variable. We also repeated uh, these analyses with publicly available New Zealand sequences uh, just for comparison. Now, this is a figure from the paper that is aiming to describe the pardon me, phylogenetic model that we used. Um, and what's important to note here, so firstly, this is uh, the uh, time period that we're looking at. So this is all 2020. And you see that we've broken the year up into these three different intervals. Um, and these intervals are um, intervals in which we allow the contact tracing effectiveness to be different. Okay, so we've got one, one um, this, this first interval, we've got one uh, contact tracing effectiveness uh, degree, and then for the orange, another one, and for the purple, another one. And the idea is that we've got a background uh, basic reproductive number that's changing through time on a weekly basis. We have smoothing priors to, to keep that in check. Um, and then, so, so this is the, the basic reproductive number that you would expect um, the, uh, would determine the, the dynamics of the epidemic. Um, in the absence of contact tracing. And then what we do is uh, for every individual um, transmission cluster like this one here, we say, all right, um, the first, uh, the first uh, sample appearing on this tree is, is this one that my mouse cursor is pointing to. And we say two days after this, the uh, reproductive numbers seen by the rest of this tree, effective for the rest of this tree, is a reproductive number that has been uh, um, scaled by a damping factor that's um, specific to which of these uh, time intervals the transmission chain lies in. So it's a, there, there are lots of variables in this model and it's a little bit uh, difficult to convey, but that's roughly what's going on. Um, this is the result. Uh, these are just the, the number of cases for comparison on, on, the, on the top um, through time. So that, uh, and they're color coded according to which interval they're for, falling in. So this was the, the first wave. And then uh, this is uh, the summer period and then the autumn wave up here. Um, and down at the, the bottom, we see the posterior support for different transmission uh, rate damping factors associated with contact tracing. And for the spring wave, you see quite different uh, values and depending on whether you're looking at the many introductions or few introductions, the large clusters or small cl clusters um, uh, partitioning of, of the, the large tree. Um, but, uh, and, and in the case of uh, this um, many introductions here, we see that there is effective um, contact tracing for this other set of uh, um, clusters, we, we, we don't see any effect. So it's very difficult to say anything about spring. For summer, for both of these, there does seem to be a robust um, damping associated with contact tracing. Um, but then for fall, we, we see a robust lack of damping uh, for contact tracing. And our explanation for this is that by this point, the contact tracing uh, infrastructure was basically overwhelmed and it was impossible to, to 
perform um, uh, impactful contact tracing at this point. And for comparison in New Zealand, um, contact tracing always seemed to work. Um, so this was just a, a calibration to ensure that uh, as we, we knew that this was going to be effective in New Zealand because the, um, the epidemic was much smaller uh, throughout 2020 at least. Um, so this at least tells us that our inference is basically working. Uh, of course, because this is joint Bayesian inference, we're also inferring the reproductive number through time, like I said. Um, it's very noisy and you can see this, this is in the background. Um, we're seeing uh, the, the pink here is the, um, uh, it is the reproductive number inferred um, through the various weeks of 2020 um, based on the model with the damping factor. Um, the, the green is without the damping factor. And what you can see there generally is that the pink is higher than the green, which is what you'd expect. Um, because um, with the, the, the green, we're, we're ignoring uh, the presence of contact tracing. And so um, the model is just uh, assuming that any reduction in RE has got to do with the actual RE reduction, whereas for the pink, um, there's also this, this possibility that it's contact tracing that's, that's working. Um, and there's a, there's a comparison here with the RE that's estimated just from the case count data. Um, what's one thing that's important here is that uh, we, we have two different priors on the sampling rate, one that puts an upper bound on the, um, the fraction of individuals in the total population that have been sampled um, and included in our study and one, one without this bound. And this really does make a big difference on the results. Um, and this is again, um, something to potentially be concerned about. Okay, so just some take home messages from that. Um, the analysis here provides some evidence that contact tracing uh, was effective um, in reducing the uh, duration of transmission chains in summer, but not in autumn. Um, and I, I said uh, that this was potentially due to contact tracing becoming overwhelmed in autumn. Um, okay, this is something that I've already said. Um, now, point, a poor estimation of jointly inferred parameters does suggest that we must be cautious in interpreting these results. Okay, does anyone have any questions about this last um, application? Because if not, I'm going to start to dive into <clears throat> a tutorial. I'm not sure how long we'll, we'll really get to work on this, um, but I wanted to at least point you in the direction of uh, the first tutorial that we always recommend people do uh, when they're get, getting started with these Bayesian phylogenetic and phylogenomic methods. Um, and it's to do with this piece of software called Beast2. And Beast2 is the workhorse behind all of the results that I've been presenting. Um, it's uh, the platform that we use for phylogenetic and phylogenomic inference. Um, there is the pro, uh, project website there, um, beast2.org. Uh, you can download the software there. <clears throat> you can uh, uh, access documentation and frequently asked questions. There are tutorials there, but for tutorials, I would really recommend that you uh, visit this dedicated tutorial website named Taming the Beast. Um, and this contains a very, a, a fairly large list of uh, curated uh, tutorials that go through the various um, packages that are available in Beast2 for doing this sort of inference. Um, so Beast2 itself is the software for implement that implements this um, Bayesian Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, for a parameter and tree inference. Um, there's a subcomponent of it called Beauty, as in Beauty and the Beast, um, which provides a GUI for uh, setting up the input file, setting up your analysis uh, that you feed into Beast, and, and which then just runs by itself. Um, there's also a, uh, cool, a tool called Tracer, which is uh, the tool for summarizing uh, parameter posteriors. Uh, 
Um, there's this tool called tree annotator that it performs a similar, similar role for tree posteriors and turns a tree posterior into a summary tree. Um, there are also various tools for visualizing uh, trees. Fig tree is, is one that's uh, usually recommended. <clears throat> and the main workflow here is that you have your sequence data, you open up beauty, um, and you load that in, set up an analysis, you save that to some XML file, that's the input format for Beast2, um, you run Beast2, load that XML file, it runs, often people will run Beast2 on, on a cluster because uh, these things can take a long time. Um, and then Beast2 itself is going to generate a parameter log file and a tree log file. Um, and both of these can be analyzed uh, using these other tools. Okay, so in order to proceed with this tutorial, uh, the first thing you need to do is to download and install Beast2 from beast2.org. Um, it's not too big of a download um, and it is self-contained. So, uh, and there's uh, um, uh, versions for um, Mac OS for GNU Linux and for Windows as well. Um, once you've done that, uh, then you can open the Taming the Beast page and locate the tutorial. The website here, I hope you can see it, is taming-the-beast.org. Um, and you can either click on the link or just go directly to slash tutorials and then find this uh, introduction to Beast 2 tutorial there. Um, now, because we don't have a lot of time, uh, I would say focus on the gray boxes in this tutorial. We're not going to finish it for sure, uh, especially if, if you're going to read through all of the text because there's a lot of background material there. Um, and I'm not saying that's, that's useless at all, but if you want to just get a, a feel for the way uh, Beast 2 works and uh, what it's capable of, um, then I've, I've, you can go a lot faster if you just uh, focus on... Um, on uh, on on the main bits. <clears throat>